So if you're able, please uh, stand for the reading of God's word this morning coming to us from the gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. I'll read this verses 1 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And these things I command you, so that you will love one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we are giving you thanks all throughout this morning for who you are and recognizing just how desperately we need you, O God. Lord Jesus, you are the vine, we are the branches. We cannot sustain ourselves. We cannot nourish ourselves. There is no life within us and certainly no fruit born through us without staying connected to the vine. And so Lord, may your word go forth now for the purpose by which you have sent it. May the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth, O God, now be pleasing unto you. Lord, our rock and our redeemer, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what you would impart through your word now that will align with what you have been speaking, Holy Spirit, since we gathered together in this space and time this morning. We give you thanks for your goodness. We give you thanks for your revelation. We give you thanks for your transforming and life-giving spirit present among us and within us now. All of it through the one in whose name we pray, in Jesus' name. Man, you may be seated. Thank you, sir. Well, thanks again to everybody that's a part of Voxology. We appreciate you all so much being here. Yeah. Of course, our own Piper Jones gets to work with that group uh, at Belmont, and so uh, that's, she's kind of our inside connection that got, got them here. So it's a blessing and a, and a privilege, of course, to, to worship with them today. Um, every Sunday morning at 7 a.m., I get a text message, and uh, I'm usually in my, my study here at the church uh, by then, and, and it's always a text message from my, from my mom, uh, sent with love from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And it's always a word of encouragement. It's always a message uh, where she tells me she's praying for me for what uh, the day will hold. And uh, I didn't get that text message this morning because uh, she's actually here with my dad. And uh, yeah. So my, my parents, Mary and Craig Anderson, are in this weekend. They didn't come to see, to see me. They came to see their granddaughter who's in 
a performance of Into the Woods at her high school. So uh, that's the way it is, as you all know, when you get to be grandparents, uh, your, your generation gets bypassed and, and, and it's the grandkids. So I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. That's good. But no, but uh, if you see my parents here today and get a chance to welcome them uh, and, and just, yeah. Uh, both my mom and dad had me in church all the time when I was a kid. And, and even though I'd kind of take my own path in my 20s, it was a, a, a path that God set me on and brought me uh, back too. And uh, he did that through my parents. And I'm so thankful for who my mom and dad are and, and what they've meant in my life and continue to be in, in my life. So uh, I just wanted to take a moment and thank them when they're here with us this morning. So I need the every hour most gracious Lord no tender voice like thine can peace afford. Sing it with me. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. Those are lyrics composed by someone who understands something about what it means to abide in Christ. To abide, as Jesus describes it in John 15, it, it means to stay close. It means to, to be truly present with someone. For what purpose? To pursue a deeper relationship, to grow in intimacy. That's what it means to abide in the way Jesus describes it. And so, when Jesus says, abide in me, as I abide in you, do you hear what he's saying? Stay close to me, Jesus says, and I will stay close to you. Be present with me in your body, soul, mind, and spirit, and I will be present to you. Why? Because as we've heard all morning, he desires to be closer to you. He desires you to know him in the way that he knows you. He desires the deepest relationship possible with us. That is why he has made us, why he has saved us. It's why you and I are here. And Jesus describes the dynamics of this relationship with him in this way. He says that I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. Now make no mistake, um, there are plenty of things you and I can do in our lives apart from Christ. We live in the busiest culture in the world, I think. Overly scheduled, so distracted, so we can, we can run ourselves ragged, we can work ourselves into the ground, we can entertain ourselves into numbness, and we can distract ourselves to death. We can most certainly do all those things apart from him, but the thing we can't do, Jesus says, apart from him, we cannot bear fruit. At least not the kind of fruit that Jesus intends for us to bear, like the fruit of obedience. Obedience to the commandments of Christ. And the fruit of joy. The kind of joy that belongs to Jesus. His joy that he says he wants alive in us that our joy may grow out of his and our joy be, may be made full, Jesus says. And the fruit of love that we might actually love one another as he loves us. This is the kind of fruit you and I are intended to bear, the kind of fruit that Christ says 
will be born in us and through us if we abide in him as he abides in us. Jesus goes on in John 15, he says, but by this my father, who is our father because of him, by this my father, Jesus says, is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so what? So prove to be my disciples. Jesus said, this is how they will know you are my disciples, if you love one another as I have loved you. Bearing this kind of fruit proves we belong to him, that we are his followers. If he is the vine and we are the branches, then he is our source. He must be the one who determines and the one who produces the fruit we are to bear. So think about it. I want to show you some images on the screen. A grapevine, like the one you see before you now, produces grapes through its branches, right? This time of year, we might not be thinking about grapes as much as we are the next one. Apples, the apple tree produces fruit through its branches. Next one even, some of you have a, more of a green thumb than I do and you know exactly what this is. A rose bush is the same. A rose bush produces beautiful blooms through its branches. The connection that's required, the nutrients, the sustenance, all the things that flow through the stem, flow through the trunk, flow through the vine, into the branches. For what purpose? So that fruit, which is life-giving, fruit that allows for multiplication, fruit that allows for life and life abundant to perpetuate. This is why the connection is so essential, so necessary. The nature of the vine is shared with the branches to which, or in our case, to whom the vine is connected. They are to be one. So my friend, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a believer in Christ, do you see yourself this way? Do you see yourself as a branch connected so essentially to the vine? Do you see your life so intimately connected to his life this way? Do you understand that you were made for his life to flow into you and to flow through you so that you might bear fruit that honors Christ and glorifies our Father? Is that what defines your life? Or is it all the busyness and the distraction and keeping up with the Joneses, whoever they are, and all of these other things that we have to do today, 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 I got, got to get out of here. I got stuff to take care of. Is that what drives you today? And I use the word drive because we are a driven culture. Nobody talks about the bearing of fruit as driving. Last week, Matthew Phillips preached a tremendous message for us talking about what does it mean to walk in the light and how fruit is born, not because we try harder, not because we work harder, not because we drive ourselves into the ground, but when you're in the presence of the light, the fruit comes over time. Same type of idea today in Jesus' words. The grapevine, the apple tree, the rose bush, we're all created to bear fruit, and so were you, and so am I. Do you know that? Or has the pace of life, the stress of life, the anxieties that are constantly weighing us down in our culture today, have, have they caused you to forget? What kind of fruit are we talking about here? Again, we, we already said obedience, obedience to the commands of Christ, which, which stem from his love and his joy. And remember what love and joy are? Paul would write about this in his letter to the church in Galatia, chapter five, the, the fruit of the spirit, right? Do you remember them? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the last one, Self-control. But how do, you, how, how do you grow in these things? If right now you're saying, yeah, I've got to be more loving. Mm, I've got to really work on being more peaceful. You're doing it wrong. Jesus says, no, 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 no. You're starting in the wrong place. Jesus says, abide in me. Abide in me and I abide in you. So if you want to be more loving... Yeah, there's lots of books you can read. Sure, there's seminars you can go to. Yeah, there's a million YouTube videos you can watch about how to be more loving. But none of that matters if you're not 
abiding in him. Abiding in him. Well, how do we do that? That's what we want to talk about in the time we have left today. How do we abide in Christ? What does that look like? What does that entail? Well, in this passage from John 15, Jesus talks about at least three different elements that are a part of what it means to abide in him. The first is this, pursuing growth in our intimacy with Christ. How many of you have learned by now that that bearing fruit in a relationship only comes through growing intimacy in that relationship? And how do we do that? How do we grow in intimacy? Well, if you're seeking to grow closer to someone, to deepen your relationship, to strengthen your connection, your, your bond, you must be intentional about at least one thing, and that is spending time with that person. A quality relationship requires quality time together, does it not? Has there ever been a relationship in your life that you would say is, is close and is intimate where you haven't spent time together? consistently on a regular basis? Maybe you didn't intend to and you were stuck together in a certain job or it was a friend from school or somebody in your family that, hey, we gotta live together, whatever it is. But over time, that relationship grew. If I desire to grow in intimacy with with my wife, I need to spend time with her. I have to pursue her heart, seeking to learn more about what she thinks, what she needs, what she desires, what pleases her. This is how I come to know her better. I abide with her and she with me. So do we think similarly when it comes to pursuing growth in our intimacy with the Lord? Do you think about spending time with him to grow closer to him? Or do you approach the word if you, if, if you, and when you do, just trying to get some sort of an answer to your problem? I'm not saying that that's not important and, and needed, it is. But even more foundational, let me tell you, as, as a pastor, I can't only study to preach. I can't do that. I have to study because I, I, I love him. I have to come to the word and say, Lord, I need, I need to hear your heart today. I need to grow in in my intimacy with you. I need to know you better. And sometimes that's not the same thing as preparing what needs to happen as we, we unpack a certain passage of scripture. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. How well do you know his words? How well do you know what he has said? How well do you know, as Jesus said, my words are truth and the truth will set you free. His words convey his heart. His words convey his will. So if his words abide in us, that means we can better know his heart, we can better know his will, and if that is the case, then Jesus says that our wish, or or more aptly, our, our prayer will be in better alignment with his heart and with his will. Jesus isn't saying just ask for whatever you want and God will give it to you. He's saying no, if my words abide in you, if you are walking with me, if you are following me, if you are are allowing your heart to be conformed to my heart and my way of life and being in this world as a human being, then your heart is going to resonate with my heart, with my will. And what we ask for will be in alignment with what he wills for us, to us, and through us. We have to know his words. So many words in our culture today, so many words blasting us all the time. Through social media, through our news feed, through every screen that's around us. I mean, every time you walk into a restaurant today, every time you go into any sort of, of, of setting like that, there are screens everywhere, everywhere. As if we needed more distraction. As if we needed to be present with everybody else except the people we're seated at the table with. This is what's happening. To us, more and more and more. All these words, so many words coming at us 24 7. But what about his words? What place do they have in your day? Who speaks the first word over your day? If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is pick up your phone, it's probably not Jesus. It's whoever texted you first, it's whosoever email you read first, it's whatever story you see on your newsfeed first. 
Who speaks the last word over your day? Before you lay your head on the pillow, is, is, it, is it Stephen Colbert? Is it whatever late night talk show host you're, you're watching? What, who is it? How does the word of God, how do the words specifically even of Jesus, how do they resonate in and throughout your day? Remember what Paul said, don't be conformed to this world. That happens through all the words, all the messages, all the things that are trying to shape us, mold us, conform us. Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of our minds. How does that happen? It happens by the Holy Spirit working in and through the word of God. And Paul goes on, he says, by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If right now you're confused about what to do in your life, if right now you're, 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 you're confused and disoriented and, and feel lost and frustrated, go to the word. Seek to abide in his presence. And sometimes, and this is the hardest thing I think for many of us to do, just sit still. Just sit still. Just sit down and say, God, I'm, I'm here. I'm here for you. I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I got all these people telling me different things. I've got all these other messages that are coming at me 24 seven. I don't know what to do, but I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna be still and know that you are God and I'm gonna listen. And then be prepared because your phone is gonna try to distract you and your heart and your mind are gonna try to distract you. And there's gonna be so many ways you're gonna have to discipline yourself to abide in him because we're not taught how to do this. Our culture conditions us to constantly need to be distracted. Next time you're standing in a checkout line, test me. How many people are staring at their phone? We have to have constant, constant, constant input today. And Jesus says, abide in me as I abide in you. Is it his word that's shaping us? If we are pursuing growth in our intimacy with Christ, we have to spend time with him. We need to learn his words because then we learn his heart, his will, and let the Holy Spirit be at work in us, transforming us in this process which over time bears fruit in us. In our relationship with God and in our relationships with each other, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So don't start again with, I need to be more loving or I need to be more patient or I need to just develop more self-control. No, start with, I need to pursue a deeper relationship with Jesus. I need to get closer to him. I need to seek him, the one who has first sought me. I need to better know him, the one who knows me better than I will ever know myself. The one who, who I need to love him, the one who has first loved me. The second thing, other than after pursuing greater intimacy and relationship with Jesus, the second thing that abiding in him uh, involves is what Jesus calls pruning. When I was in college, I worked the summers back home in my hometown at that time, Forest City, Iowa. Uh, I worked for the public school system. I did, I did groundskeeping and landscaping. And to this day, I've never had a better boss than my boss in those years. His name was Paul Jefferson. He was the maintenance director at Forest City Community Schools. He taught me so much about life. He had an unbelievable sense of humor. Uh, he was so great with people. He taught me more about leadership maybe than I've ever learned anywhere else. And he taught me more than anyone, literally, about pruning. Paul taught me that, that pruning is all about directing the growth of the plant. It is all about having a, a vision for what that plant can become, what that plant may grow into. And so in the pruning process, you, you cut away, you, you remove, you, you redirect what parts of the plant are unnecessary, what part of the plants are necessary to make that growth possible. Sometimes that can mean, and, and I had to learn this with Paul, sometimes that can mean it looks like you killed the plant. <laughs> sometimes it means so much has to be removed, so much has to be taken away in order for its growth to be redirected. 
So for example, many trees, many trees want to grow low and out. And yet if you are intending for that tree to grow up tall and strong, pruning has to happen. The lower branches must be removed. For if a tree is meant to grow tall, those branches growing outward lower on the trunk will take too much energy. They will consume too many resources that are needed for the tree to grow upward. Sometimes that pruning process can seem harsh. It can seem, like I said, like it's doing far more harm than, than good, but this isn't the case. Removing what is not helping the plant grow as it needs to can appear to be harmful at first, but it is necessary, it is needed. And again, you have to trust the one who's doing the pruning. You have to trust the gardener. You have to trust, as Jesus calls him, our father who is the vine dresser. For he sees what we cannot. He sees how this plant is meant to grow. He sees what this is to become. And so when you are one of the branches connected to the vine, this can be tough to take in because this pruning has to happen in our lives. It has to happen in our hearts. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? Because here's the purpose of pruning. That it may bear more fruit. And then Jesus talks about this thing, uh, cleansing, which is connected to, to, to pruning in this way. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. How are we cleansed according to Jesus? How are we pruned according to Jesus? By the word of God. When we seriously begin to let the word seriously deal with us, pruning is going to happen. There are things that the Holy Spirit will bring to your attention in and through the word of God. Like we said, if we are learning his words, especially the words of Christ, things in us that need to be removed, things in us that need to be redirected, these will come to light. The writer of the Hebrews put it this way. He said, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Maybe today we could say sharper than any pruning shears. Piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions, what? Of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The word of God, which is spoken to us through the Bible, the word of God made flesh, who is most fully revealed as the one we call Jesus Christ. The word reveals what needs to be pruned and he will do it. So let me ask you, is the Lord doing any pruning in your life right now? Are you submitting yourself to him? Or are you doing what we often do, which is resist that, fight that? not remembering that the vine dresser knows better than, than we do. Is there pruning happening somehow in your family right now? Is there pruning happening in your business? Is there pruning happening in this church? Remember, God's purpose for pruning is clear, that we may bear more fruit, especially the fruit of the Spirit obedience to the commands of Christ, all of which culminates in the words of Jesus, again, in verse 12 of John 15, where he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus will say, why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do? Is it fear? Is it distrust? Is it anxiety? Is it just self-centeredness and I want what I want and if it doesn't align with what Jesus does, I'll do my thing and go my own way? Jesus doesn't come to, to, to beat us over the head into submission. He comes to invite us. He comes to say, apart from me, apart from me, you can do all these other things, but they will not bear the fruit 
that you were intended to bear. They will not bring the life that you were intended to experience. Life connected to the vine. Life practicing the love of Christ. And that's the last thing we'll talk about this morning. Abiding in Christ means we are pursuing growth in our intimacy with him. It means that we are experiencing pruning as the Father directs our lives. And the last thing is, abiding in Christ means we are practicing the love of Christ as we receive it from him and we share it with one another. The greatest fruit we are intended to bear is love. Jesus says, again, in John 15, verses nine and 10, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So let me ask you, do you desire to obey the commands of Christ? Not as a, as a slave. And Jesus points this out right here in this passage. He says, I, I, you're, you're not slaves but friends of God through Christ. Jesus says the the slave doesn't know what the master is doing, but Jesus says, "I, I am revealing all these things to you that the Father has revealed to me. Friends of God are are chosen, appointed, Jesus says, to be part of what God is doing in bringing hope and salvation through his love to a hurting and broken and self-destructive world. Christians, we have so much purpose, such immense value. And every day, every day, my heart breaks for someone that I encounter who does not know, does not believe how deeply you are valued by the one who has made you, the one who loved you enough to die for you, the one who has created you to know him and to walk in the freedom, to walk in the joy, to walk in the peace that he so freely offers to all who will come and come to him, all who will receive him, all who will abide in him as he desires to abide in you. This is why we are here. We are saved and sent in his love to go and bear the fruit of his love. And that fruit, that love, Jesus says, will abide. If you want to know what's going to count in your life, so many men, so many men I know strive and work their fingers to the bone. They sacrifice their families. They sacrifice their health. They sacrifice everything they have because they want to leave some sort of portfolio for their families. And I stand at their funeral and all their kids say, I just wish you'd have given me more time. I wish I'd have known him better. If you want to know what's going to remain, Jesus tells us, love. The relationships that you invest yourself in, that's what lasts. That's what remains, even when our time on this earth is gone. That's where your legacy is. Your legacy is not in how much money can you leave your kids or your grandkids. Your legacy is how much has God poured into me that I pour into them in loving them, teaching them who they are in Christ, lifting them up in a world that wants to tear them down, supporting them just as Voxology has been here today and supporting and, and, and lifting us up together in worship, recognizing that, that the, what we do with the next generation makes all the difference. We should be, if we're a church that's mature, a church that is, is mature in Christ, we should be constantly looking for every opportunity we have to lift up young people in who they are in Christ Jesus. The things that remain, the things that endure, it's life that comes through the vine. That image one more time. Do you see it? The life of God which flows through Jesus Christ. This is what we talk about at the table. His body broken for us. His blood shed for us. His life poured out for us that any who would receive him, his life and love poured into us, flowing through us. We are connected to him. That's what Jesus meant when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. It's another way of saying this same thing. If you are a branch and you are not connected to the vine, my life is not in you. But that's the thing. It can be. It's supposed to be. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And so right now, as we draw this 
message to a close, I want you to be thinking about your own life right now. What does that mean to you today to consider how you are abiding in Christ? How are you pursuing intimacy with him? How are you seeking to better hear and understand and live according to his words rather than all these other words that are bombarding you all day, every day? Where is God pruning in your life and in your relationships? And maybe today you you need to surrender to him. Maybe today you need to ask him and you haven't before. Lord, show me what this is. I've been trying to hang on so tightly to something you've been saying I need to let go of. I've been trying to to keep something that you're wanting to, to move out of my life so that, why? So that your fruit can be grown and born in me and through me. And where, where has the love of Christ grown cold in your heart? Where has the love of God seemed difficult for you to believe in, seemed difficult for you to receive, and, and even if you have received it, it has, has been trapped within your own heart. Instead of it flowing through you, it has, has come to you and gotten stuck. And you need his help to heal. You need his help to let go whatever it is that's that's, that's blocking the flow of his love through you in your life. Yes, you need his peace. Yes, you need his joy. Yes, you need faith. Yes, you need all of these things. But at the very heart of it all, what you need is him. So I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet if you're able. I want us to sing that hymn together just like we started this message. I need thee every hour. And there's four short verses to this hymn. And I want you to be singing this, contemplating what it means to abide in Christ and how it all begins, how it all ends with with him and our need for him. So wherever you are today and whatever this has meant to you thus far in your experience with God in this time, Let's sing this to him together. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. me 
chorus one more time, just the voices. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Lord, we thank you. We can only come to you because you have first come to us. We can only seek you because you have already sought us out. We can only love you because you have first so richly loved us. So Lord, right now, you and you alone know what every heart needs to hear. You alone know where every wound remains. Where doubt lingers, where fear looms, where anxiety overwhelms, where desperation seems to reign. And you are greater, so much greater than all these things. And Lord, we get so busy and we get so distracted, even with, with good things, even with church things. And then all it takes is a moment where your presence breaks through the noise, breaks down the distractions, and, and we, are, we are touched. As the psalmist says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And so Lord, we ask that you would draw us nearer to you, for we need you. Make us more aware of your presence. Make us so acutely aware of your need. And sometimes it's in our pruning that it's the only way that happens. But you are good, you are so faithful, so life-giving. And so Lord, minister to us now as we leave this place that your love may flow not just to us, but that it may flow through us so that as we would leave and, and walk into this world, wherever you would send us this afternoon, wherever you would send us on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or throughout the week, Lord God, may your love flow through us that the words around us that tell us how dark the world is and how evil it is, Lord, that we would speak light and love and life in the name of Jesus Christ, that we would know we are yours, that your words would be on our lips, that your will would be carried out through our lives, that your heart would beat within our hearts, that we would know we are yours. Friends of God, children of God through Christ, and we need you desperately every step of the way, every moment of the day, every breath of our lives. Let us abide in you as you abide in us. Keep us attached, connected as branches to the vine. We trust in you. 
and we give you thanks with full and grateful hearts. In Jesus' name. And may the Lord bless you, keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and may he give you his peace. Let us leave this place together knowing that we remain connected as branches connected to the vine that he is. Amen.